All right, in this chapter we've shown you lots of different crystal structures, but pause and think for a minute. Way back when, how did we actually figure out what structures correspond to what formulas, right? Well, way back in the day, again, we had crystals, we had things like this, and you could say, all right, since this crystal has a certain shape to it, I could mathematically imagine what the structure might be that would produce this shape if it were to grow, right? This cubic shape probably came from a cubic lattice. This one probably didn't come from a cubic lattice. And then other materials like this obsidian, which is amorphous, doesn't really have those facets, right? It's just sort of a lump, okay? So in the early days, 1600s up to, you know, 1880, that's really all they could do is they would measure the angles between these gem faces and then speculate as to what should be uh, happening in the crystal structure. That's the best they could do. That all changes at the dawn of the 20th century. 1895, Wilhelm C. Röntgen discovers X-rays, right? It's a form of electromagnetic radiation. It just has really short wavelengths, therefore it's high energy. And it's short enough in wavelength that it starts to interact differently with matter than visible light, for example, or other wavelengths. Uh, what I think is amazing about this, by the way, it, he gets the Nobel Prize for it in 1901. But first off, he gives all the money to the university, which is rad because he believed in ex expanding science, right? But he also took out no patents on this technology on purpose because he realized that he had just discovered something that was going to change science. And if he patented it, then it was going to prevent other people from using this in advancing science. Um, we don't see that sort of thing happening today. That's pretty rad. Okay, and sure enough, because it was available, a few short years later in 1912, you've got Bragg and his son who developed X-ray diffraction using X-ray radiation, right? Uh, but this was interesting. They won the Nobel Prize for it in 1915, William Bragg and his son. So Bragg and Bragg both won the Nobel Prize in 1915 for this. It's pretty rad. Here's how it works. Before we dive into how it interacts with matter, let's just think broadly about how diffraction occurs. So diffraction occurs when a wave encounters a regularly spaced object that one, can scatter the wave. So it has to be something that can scatter the wave. And two, it has spacings comparable to the magnitude of the X-ray wavelength. So um, think of it like this. Crystals have a regular arrangement of atoms. Good. It's periodic, right? They're periodic. So that's check, check that box off. Now next off, uh, think about a wave striking a lighthouse. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but if you look down on it, like if this is your lighthouse, in come your waves, and then when they hit the lighthouse, they there's diffraction, right? There's scattering going back out afterwards, right? But that's only because the amplitude, or the, that's only because the wavelength between those is more or less on par with the size of that lighthouse. You don't get that scattering from a pebble, right? Because the wavelength of waves is much larger than the size of an itty bitty little pebble, right? So it has to be roughly the same size, okay? How about this? If we had a regular array of lighthouses, then the most secondary waves would cancel out one. So for example, here we've got two lighthouses, right? If the waves coming in hit those, this is what you get. And you probably saw this in an introductory physics class. You get regions of destructive interference where the water would be calm. And you get regions of constructive interference where you'd get larger waves afterwards, right? So destructive and constructive interference cause these sort of patterns, right? So let's write this out. What does constructive interference look like? Okay, you've got a wave and then it undergoes another sort of event. And after that event, let's assume that they are still in phase with one another, right? So they still look like they did afterwards. Therefore, these would combine together and you would get a wave with the same amplitude, the same wavelength as before, right? This hasn't changed, but the amplitude would be larger. Now we've got a larger amplitude, right? That's bigger than it was before because they constructively add together. What's the other possibility? Destructive interference, right? Destructive interference would look similar to start, right? Our waves are in phase initially, then some sort of scattering event occurs, and as they leave, one is like this, but the other is out of phase. It's completely out of phase. So those would combine together to give nothing. It would be complete destructive interference, right? So that's constructive and destructive interference. So this is what's so cool. Um, we can use this to determine aspects of the crystal structure. And this is what won the Nobel Prize. It's actually pretty straightforward. Here's how it works. Okay, if we know that the wavelength is more or less on the same size as the atomic separation of atoms, then 
when the light comes in, it's going to hit your sample and then it's going to reflect off the surface, right? That's called specular reflection, when basically this angle that it comes in at matches the angle that it leaves at. That's specular reflection. So the light coming in is going to bounce off the surface of your material, but that's only if it hits an atom, right? So this top one hit an atom and then it kept on going after reflecting. But this one below it, check out this light that was coming in below, it missed that atom, so it kept on going till it hit that atom, right? And then when it hit that atom, it bounces off, right? And then this one, same thing. It missed both of those first two layers, but hit that one and then it bounced off. Why does this matter? Well, think about it. The light travels different distances depending on which layer it hits, right? The top one stopped right here. So all of the light was traveling the same distance up to this point. All of this light traveled the same distance up until that point. But then the stuff that was in the second layer, it traveled an extra distance from here to here. And then from here to here, before it catches up with the light that bounced off the first layer, right? And the stuff that was below, it traveled an extra distance from here to here and from there to there before it catches up with the light that was exiting from before. So here's the clever thing. They realized, and this was the whole Nobel Prize, they said, okay, this extra distance that gets traveled right here, that extra distance, this extra distance, if it is equal to an integer number times the wavelength, then it's going to come out in the same phase as it entered, right? If the regular beam came out doing this, and that's equal to uh, an integer number of the wavelengths, it's also going to come out the same way. But if it's not, it's going to come out opposite. If it comes out opposite, these waves cancel one another out, and you would get no constructive inference, you get destructive inference, so basically no radiation or no light will escape. But if it's an equal, but if this distance is equal to it, then it will escape and you'll get constructive interference, right? And that's it. So all they needed to do was to figure out, okay, if the light's coming in at some angle, right? And this is your angle theta right there. What would this distance right there be? And the whole thing to that is to realize that, okay, that distance right there will be a function of how far these things are separated and the incoming angle. It's going to be D times the sine of theta, right? That is the extra path length. So there's gonna be two of those, right? Because it goes one of those and then two of those. So if your wavelength is equal to both of those path lengths put together, so 2D sine of theta, then you will get constructive interference. That's it, that is the whole thing. All of a sudden they could shine light on things, they could bring in radiation, have it hit your sample, they could change the angle of the incoming radiation, so it's going to bounce off at the same angle over here. And as they change the angle, all of a sudden, at certain points, they would observe peaks occur. And so from those peaks that occurred where the light was able to get out and they were able to measure it again, they knew that it must correlate to specific interplanar spacings that relate to, you know, integer values of your, of your radiation wavelength. That's it. That's the Nobel Prize. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a geometry problem is all they solved. But doing that, all of a sudden they had a tool to measure interplanar spacing. Now, what do you do with that interplacing and how do you turn it into crystal structures? We'll cover in the next video.